Hello everybody. Today we're going to be looking at some acrylic glazing techniques but as we're painting a cup I wanted to talk first about ellipses which is the name we use for a circle in perspective and a really good example of that is a cup. So when we have the cup and we're looking down on it we know that the rim of the cup is a perfect circle but when we see it in perspective we don't see a circle and what we see is an ellipse. So here I'm tilting the cup and you can see now that I have what looks like a squashed circle which is narrower in the depth of the circle and wider in the width of the circle. And there are a few guidelines for how to draw ellipses correctly so I'm going to put my cup down on the table and switch the camera angle to show you what I mean. So now I have the cup on the table in front of me and you can see looking at this that because the top of the cup is lined up with my eye level at this position that it appears to be a straight line. But because I'm looking down on the base of the cup there's a curve and that's the ellipse from the bottom of the cup where that circle, that round form is seen in perspective. So if I were to put my head completely flat on the table I would see the bottom of the cup as a straight line and the curve at the top of my cup would appear but it would appear to go upwards. Whereas if I raise my position now see how I gradually see more and more of the curve of the cup the higher my position in relation to it. So this is the position I'm going to draw the cup in. First thing I need to do to get the proportion of the cup right is to compare the width to the height. And what I do, the way I do this is by holding up a ruler or a pencil in front of me and line up the side at the end of the pencil with one side of the top of the cup and place my thumb where I see it hitting the other side of the top of the cup. I now turn this around and compare that measurement with the height of the cup including the ellipse on the top and there we can see that the height of the cup is more than the width. It's important when you do this to keep your arm straight because if you vary the bend in your arm you will vary the way you see the measurement. So it's about one and a third times the width into the height. What I can do now is transfer that measurement to my piece of paper, starting with what feels like a comfortable width for the cup on the paper. So I can just decide that my width is going to be very small or make it a bit bigger. I'm going to go about here and then I just take that measurement, put a little mark at the top first actually, take that measurement and take my one and one third which brings me down to here. So this gives me a box in which to place my cup. The next step is to look at where on the side of the cup the curve starts and in my view it's around here. So I mark off the position on the side and then I draw a nice smooth curve. This line can be quite feathery to begin with while you find the curve and then once you've got it you can draw it in a little bit more confidently. So an ellipse should be a smooth curve, it shouldn't drop and then go flat across and then up 
and there shouldn't be any pointy corners at the side so it should smoothly transition into the side of the cup. And you can play around with it until your curve is nice and even. Similarly at the top we need to look at the relationship between the depth of the ellipse and the width of the ellipse. And if I have a look at mine, I can draw hold up my pencil or ruler and line up, line it up with the bottom of the curve and notice where on the side of the cup it lines up to. And mine is about here. So what I'm going to do is draw a line straight across here. My top ellipse is going to fit into here. And what I'm going to do is to quarter this top box. And that now gives me the position where my lips needs to meet each mark off on the quarter. So again, a smoothly curving ellipse with no pointy corners on the side and the curve is, while it's not the same all the way around, it's evenly curved so that there aren't any sides that are straight or eye shapes because they are both incorrect. So what I'm going to do is apply a tonal underpainting and then glaze some colour on the top. What I'm interested in, looking at the cup, is how the light hits it. So the window is on the left hand side and the light is hitting the outside of the cup on the left hand side and the inside of the cup on the right hand side. So there's shadow here around the base but on the inside the shadow is on the left hand side. So I'm going to play around with that in the painting. I've created a Stay Wet palette for myself. This is some damp paper towel kitchen roll with a little bit of baking parchment on top. Unfortunately mine's brown but um, never mind. And I've put out some colours on here. I've got some burnt umber, ultramarine, cadmium yellow, alizarin crimson, got some water and I have a couple of synthetic round brushes with fairly fine points.
I've left this to dry now for a couple of hours and it's ready to work on top of. And my Stay Wet palette has worked quite well because my acrylic is still wet, so that's very satisfying. So now what we're going to do is to add some depth and make the paint a little bit thicker. But using the tones that we've already established in the painting with thinner glazes. So I'm going to take some of the white. I'm using exactly the same colours of Burnt Umber. And a touch of the blue. To make it a little bit greyer and more neutral. And what I want on the palette is a range of tones that I can dip in and out of. That's probably about as dark as it gets. And I'm using a, a flatter brush just to get into these areas. What I'm doing is matching the tone that's underneath but applying thicker paint. I'm using a slightly bluer mixture on this side because I want a cooler colour in the shadows. And this will hopefully give it more of a sense of depth. One thing that does happen when you're doing any art is the more you look at something, the more you see. So this is also an opportunity to adjust things as you go along. There might be subtleties in the tone that you hadn't noticed before. And now you can start finessing and adding some more detail to the tone. And this stage also allows me to cover up anything that's not quite right in the background with a little bit of white paint. So I slightly went over my edge in this point here and here. So I just do a little bit of tidying up. And here I went over the boundary of the shadow a little bit. I could also add some highlights. So 
So now we're moving on to the glazing and what I'm going to be doing is applying layers of transparent colour so that I pick up the tones from the background. So I've completely cleaned my water and cleaned my brushes as well because what I don't want is any pigment left over from the white mixture with the brown because anything that has white in will make your paint more opaque. You may not have a choice about the colours that you're using but if you do and you can tell whether it's opaque or transparent you can then pick the one that's more transparent. So on these two paints from Golden Acrylics for example each one has a, a, a little swatch of the paint actually painted on the label across these black bars in the background and you can see how the ultramarine is quite transparent because we can still see the bars but on the cobalt blue it's completely covered it and so for this exercise this would be a better blue for me to use. And on a good quality paint it will also tell you on the back where this paint is in the scale from transparent through to opaque and this is quite transparent so that's the blue that I've picked. I've also picked my alizarin hue which on the back very clearly tells me it's transparent and my cadmium yellow tells me it's opaque so I have picked this Hansi yellow medium which we can see here is quite transparent but as I said you may not have that choice so just use the colours that you have. 